I know I didn't give you any warning, and at another hour from now, we'll be going live on our YouTube channel doing our uh, Marriage Mondays. But we flew home today from the East Coast, from Michigan area, and we left early this morning, and we got home. We had a wonderful afternoon, um, morning, evening, dinner time, not, uh, noon time, with our grandbabies, and uh, caught up a little bit there, and uh, had a great time with them, and I'm just now getting around to having Bible study. So I'm kind of hoping that um, many of you will join me. I know... Uh, in Michigan, you are probably just beginning to finish up, if finished up, your uh, Bible study. Maybe you haven't even finished it up yet. And if you're on the West Coast, you're probably just getting off work. So I don't know if it's going to be a good time or not, but I really wanted to get to this Bible study today because we can get behind so quickly if we don't stay diligent with it. Hi, Celinda. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Crystal. Hi, DB. DB Tech, I'm not sure who that is. Let me know your name. Uh, Bulldozer, how about that one? Nice to see you. For those of you who might uh, be planning to join me this Sunday in uh, Aberdeen Amory, uh, Mississippi, that would be the um, North Mississippi Worship Center with uh, Lucy and Dudley, Pastor Lucy and Dudley Nash. Um, I won't be there next Sunday simply because um, they've had to shut down their service for a week or two due to uh, the virus that's going on. And so um, they called me yesterday. Hi, David Berry. So nice to see you. And um, so I won't be able to fulfill that um, wonderful uh, privilege to get to preach next week there. But I will reschedule it. And I'm probably still coming to Mississippi because it's my mother's 88th birthday and my mother's amazing to me and I love her so much. And so uh, I'm just letting you know, Tiffany, especially Tiffany, because you were probably going to drive from Louisiana and I need to let a few others know that I just uh, found out today. So um, uh, we won't be there in Aberdeen Amory this coming Sunday. So Let's get going in Genesis chapter 30. This is a powerful, powerful chapter along with many others in Genesis. Battle of the Brides is what the subject topic is here in uh, chapter 30 of Genesis with um, the Passion Translation. It says, when Rachel saw that she could not give Jacob children, her jealousy toward her sister simmered. So she said to Jacob, give me sons or I'll die. Jacob became furious with Rachel and said, Am I God? He's the one keeping you from bearing children. She, she replied, Here's my servant, Bilhah. Sleep with her. She can be my surrogate. Then I can have children through her and build a family. So Rachel gave her servant, Bilhah, to Jacob as another wife. And Jacob slept with her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. And Rachel named him Dan, saying, God has vindicated me. He heard my voice and gave me a son. Then her servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Rachel named him Naphtali, saying, I have wrestled mightily with my sister, and I won. And if you have your uh, Passion Translation, I hope you're reading the commentaries. They are so powerful here. Uh, ironically, it says Rachel dies while giving birth to her second son, but we're not there yet. That'll happen in Genesis 35. Literally, that she may bear upon my knees is what the Hebrew says when I read it in the Amplified this morning. That's what it says. And it was a Hebrew figurative expression that refers to the practice of obtaining children through the service of another woman, a surrogate, who uh, and, a le and then legally adopting the child as one's own. And so she says, Bilhah will be my surrogate. And then Jacob takes her as a wife and um, sleeps with her and she gets pregnant. And first uh, is the son, Dan, which means um, judged or decided in my favor. The judge decided uh, in my favor. The nan Dan sounds like the verb to judge in Hebrew. It contains a word play on his name, God has vindicated, which is the name Danani in Hebrew, God has vindicated me. The name Naphtali, the second son, means wrestle or contest, struggle or fight. Um, the Hebrew is uh, with wrestling of Elohim, posing both a translation and an interpretive problem here. 
there are three ways to understand this phrase. Many scholars see Elohim as a descriptive term uh, for an intensity meaning great or might. Some interpret the statement as Rachel was wrestling with God for his favor so that he would open her womb even through Bilhah. He, uh, she was wrestling with God, uh, pleading um, before the the uh, righteous judge in the court of heaven. She's pleading her case in, in a legal sense. Some interpret it that way. Some see it as a mysterious struggle or fateful contest of God or playing a trick on her sister. Nonetheless, uh, this was one troubled home, and absolutely that is the case. When you look at this, any time you put two um, women in the kitchen, you're going to have uh, to deal with the personalities of that. And now he not only has uh, two wives, sisters uh, to boot, Leah and Rachel, but he also has now Bilhah is thrown into the mix. And then another one is coming on very quickly uh, onto the scene. Now, then her servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Rachel named him Naphtali. I've wrestled mightily with my sister, she says. When others would say she was wrestling with God for favor, here she's saying, I wrestled with my sister and I won. Meanwhile, when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah. Now you've got four women. This Jacob, I mean, he must have thought he'd died and gone to heaven, or maybe he thought he'd died and go to hell. Who knows? With uh, four women at his uh, beck and call, but then also they're making demands on him. They're all wanting to get pregnant. They're all wanting to give him sons. They're all vying for attention. They're all vying for uh, position in his life. I know, Celinda, I can't even imagine it. Uh, it's just something that we can't imagine but you can guarantee there was unrest in the home there was strife there was confusion there was competition they were um in a in it was just not a good scene it was not a good place for god to show up because agreement is where god shows up not in all of this disagreement and competition as jacob struggled with his older brother Rachel now struggled with her older sister. And this it just backs up, we'll be talking about this in less than an hour in Marriage Mondays, this just backs up how uh, what you don't deal with and you marry, then the, your mate now has to deal with what you didn't deal with especially the woman becomes the man. She takes on his name. She takes on his nature. Uh, she takes on his victories, but she also takes on the things he's not overcome. They become her issues, and she must overcome them and help him overcome them. So now Leah, who apparently, and Rachel up until this point, had not had this trouble. Yep, envy and jealousy is reigning supreme. But remember, Jacob is the head of the house and everything that was in him is now manifesting in the girls, manifesting in the sisters. Rachel is struggling with her older sister, just like Jacob struggled with Esau. Rachel is tricking Leah, just like Jacob tricked Esau. So here now we have this all going on and the dynamics are just not good here. Meanwhile, when Leah saw that she ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah, gave her to Jacob as another wife. So now there are four wives here. Hi Vanessa, hi Crystal, thanks for joining us. Zilpah bore Jacob a son and Leah named him Gad. Now remember, who's naming these sons? The maids are not naming the sons, the servants are not naming the sons, the servants are surrogates giving birth for the two sisters and the, and giving birth on the knees of the sisters. The sisters are adopting the sons. They're naming the sons and they are now their children. So the, the maids, the servants are just being used, even though they're called a wife here, the, the children are, are not theirs, even though they're probably rearing them. They're probably nursing them. They're probably the wet nurse for them. Who knows uh, what all is happening in this house, but it's a mess. So what good, uh, named him Gad saying, what good fortune. Zilpah bore Jacob a second son and Leah named him Asher saying, oh, happy day. All the women will say she's happy now. One day during wheat harvest, Reuben found some mandrake plants in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Now the mandrake plant was supposed to be like an erotic plant. Um, it actually, it shouldn't be filtered in, but the Greek uh, goddess 
uh, let me think about what her name was. This Greek goddess, um, the Aphrodite, what was her name? I can't think of her name. Any anyway, Aphrodite, maybe, maybe that was her name. Uh, the Aphrodite Greek goddess of love, beauty, sex. Uh, she was known as the Lady of the Mandrakes. So when the Mandrakes came home, uh, they treated it like eating oysters. You know, the uh, the sex drive was increased. And so it was an important thing when you're competing to see who's going to have the most sons. This was one of those things you wanted to have. And so Leah's son, um, Reuben brought some home, and it had an erotic connotation, and were considered in that culture to have aphrodisiac properties. Aphrodite, the Greek goddess, there it is, of love, beauty, sex, was known as Lady of the Mandrake. The Hebrew root for mandrake is similar to the word for love. But they're also, they're trying everything. They're trying spells, they're trying uh, aphrodisiacs, they're trying everything. And uh, Jacob is in the middle of all this because he didn't deal with his own problem. Now he's having to deal with his problems manifesting in his wives. One day during wheat harvest, Reuben came home with the mandrakes. Leah, to his mother Leah, Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Leah replied, you already took away the affection of my husband. So now you're going to take my son's mandrakes too? Rachel said, all right then, I'll let him sleep with you tonight in exchange for some of your son's mandrakes. I just had to stop when I read that and I said, okay, wow, what in the world is going on here? The women are acting like they're in control of who the man sleeps with. She's like, well, okay, I'll, I'll send him over and he'll sleep with you tonight if you let me have some of the mandrakes. All right, all right, I'll send him over to you like he's a puppet. And, and this is, hi, hi Jesse, thanks for joining us. Hi, Vanessa, I know, isn't it amazing? Wow, Rachel, are you there with Jesse t tonight? Uh, that evening, when Jacob was coming home from the field, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must sleep with me tonight, for I've paid for your services with my son's mandrakes. I I'm still a, a little bit appalled at this, and yet Jacob doesn't seem to be bothered at all. In fact, he acts like he's liking all this. So Jacob slept with Leah that night. God listened compassionately to Leah's cry. She became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son, whom she named Issachar, saying, God rewarded me for giving my maidservant to my husband. Now don't forget every one of these names and the importance of these names because they turn out to be the 12 tribes of Israel. And so once again, Leah conceived and bore Jacob a sixth son, whom she named Zebulun, saying, God has given me good gifts for my husband. Now he will accept me, for I've given him six sons. Lastly, Leah gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Now, I could take a part down below and read to you the name Iskar comes from the word reward. The name Zebulun sounds like the word honor or raise up or accept. Dinah means judgment or even vindication. So all the names mean something. They're not just some names she got out of a baby book or even handing down some family names. Each name is prophesying. Uh, they're prophesying. So um, let's go on here. Uh, so she conceived and bore a son and named him. Okay, now, wait, I didn't want to skip over that. Lastly, Leah gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah or Vindication. And God listened to Rachel's heart cry and had compassion on her and made her fertile. Now, finally, Rachel conceives and bore a son and named him Joseph, saying, God has taken away my disgrace. May Yahweh add to me another son. So she was not satisfied because she had one son. Leah had given uh, Jacob six sons and also uh, Zilpah and Bilhah, they had given sons too. So Jacob makes a deal with Laban. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, release me to go back home to my homeland. You know how hard I've worked for you these many years to finish paying for my two wives. Give them to me along with my children and I'll be on my way. So now Jacob has acquired quite a bit. Laban countered, if you please, I have learned by divine inquiry that I have become prosperous because of you and the blessing of Yahweh that's on your life. Just name your price and I'll give it to you. Jacob replied, you know how hard I've worked for you and how your livestock has increased under my care. 
the little you had before I came has multiplied greatly, for Yahweh has blessed you wonderfully because I am here. Jacob is recognizing that his father, the father, uh, his grandfather, the father of blessing and favor is upon him. It comes right down through the bloodline through Isaac, and now it is in Jacob's life, and it's happening and coming forth, and Laban is benefiting because Jacob is working for him. He's managing everything for him, and Laban is the one getting rich here, and Jacob's like, it's time for me to build my own my own family instead of building his. So Laban, um, he has greatly multiplied you because, because of me, because I'm here, but now I need to provide for my own family too. So Laban asked, what should I give you? Nothing, Jacob replied. You don't need to give me a thing. If you will do but one thing for me, I will continue to care for your flocks. So life goes on here. They're making a deal, but they're making a deal for the future. It's not going to happen in the, in the next few weeks. Um, he's been here now 14 years and maybe even longer. Hi, Savannah. Hi, uh, Ms. Mr. Nolan. Thanks for joining me. Nothing. Jacob said, you don't need to give me a thing. If you will do but one thing for me, I will continue to care for your flocks. Just let me pass through all your flocks today and take out every speckled and spotted sheep or goat and every black lamb. That's all the payment I ask. And in the future, when you review my wages, the integrity of my dealings with you will be obvious. If you find any am animal among mine that is not speckled, spotted, or black, then you will know that I stole it. Agreed, Laban said. We'll do what you've suggested. But that same day, Laban secretly removed all the male and female goats that were speckled or spotted, all that had white on them and all the black lambs and left them under the care of his sons. In other words, everything that Jacob had asked for, Laban made it impossible for any of the offspring to be the colors or the um, discoloration or the uh, uh, blemish, blemish, some would say, just because they were speckled or whatever. And so uh, Laban goes through and removes every one of those bulls, every one of those males, every one of those females, and he takes them out of the herds so that there can be no reproduction of that. So he, he is still, he's still cheating. He's still tricking Jacob. Jacob is still paying for the field of seed that he planted in trick and scheme and deceiving. He's still being tricked, schemed, and deceived. So Laban, Laban secretly removed all the male and female goats that were speckled or spotted, all that had white on them and all the black lambs, and left them under the care of his sons. He set a distance of a three-day journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob continued to tend the rest of Laban's flocks. In other words, he put a three-day journey between them so the uh, speckled or the black sheep could not go and have sex with the others, and so that would, not, that would just stop all of that. And um, he was expecting Jacob to have nothing left to pull from the herd. Jacob, however, cut green branches of poplar, almond, and plane trees, and peel back part of their bark to expose the white inner wood of the branches. Then he set the partially peeled branches inside the water, inside the water troughs where the goats would see them when they came to drink, for they made it when they came to the water troughs. They were uh, multitasking. While they drank and ate, they also had sex. And as they lowered their heads to drink, they saw the striped branches in front of their eyes. Miraculously, they gave birth to streaked, speckled, and spotted young. Now, you might say, is this some kind of horticulture? Is this some kind of agricultural thing that, um, that you've never heard of? No, uh, God gave Jacob this in a dream, and he told him if he would do it, that God would reward him. And it's kind of like he said, go dip seven times in the Jordan River, the dirtiest river, and you'll come up clean. Or let me spit in the mud and let's make clay and I'm going to put clay on your eyes and then you're going to be healed. It was just one of those things where God said, if you'll do this and, and you'll, you'll just obey me, then I'm going to give you what you're asking for. So uh, this is what happened. They gave birth to streaked, speckled, and spotted young. But with the mating ewes, on the other hand, he made them face the streaked or completely blacked, black animals in Laban's flock. By doing this, he produced his own special flocks, which he didn't allow to mingle with Laban's. Moreover, 
Every time the stronger females were in heat, Jacob laid the partially peeled branches in the water troughs in front of the flock so that they would mate among the branches. But he didn't place the branches in front of the scrawny goats when they mated, leaving the feeble animals for Laban and the stronger for himself. And honestly, there is so much tricking and scheming and deceiving here going on. I don't know how they lived with themselves, but Jacob was just trying to build his flock. Laban had tricked him, and so now God gave him a plan how to build up what he had asked for. Hi, beloved. Thanks so much for tuning in. In this way, Jacob quickly grew very wealthy and owned large flocks, a great number of camels and donkeys, and many male and female servants. I just want to read you one commentary here. This is a shorter chapter, but I want to. I want you to hear this one thing about all of this about uh, that's going on with the flocks and how they're pulling back the the bark and causing the um, different things to be seen. I want you to listen to this. This was not simply principles of animal husbandry, but a divine miracle revealed to Jacob through a dream. God always has unique and puzzling methods to perform a miracle. He may require bathing seven times in the Jordan River, parting the Red Sea, or having the sun stand still. God displayed his creative power through the birth of those multicolored young goats. Perhaps the miracle teaches us, and this is what I wanted you to hear, that what we see or gaze upon can impregnate us with the object of our vision. For you can determine what you conceive by what you behold. And you all have heard me so many times say this, if, if you show me your friends, I will show you your future. If you show me what you're hanging with, who you're hanging with, I will show you what you're going to give birth to because you, you're going to be influenced and you're going to give birth to whatever it is you're allowing to influence you. Here it's showing us that what we look upon, we're going to wind up letting it in our heart, it's going to come out our mouth, and we're going to give birth to it. So we need to be careful what we allow in our eye gate, in our ear gate, what we allow to get inside of us. Perhaps the miracle teaches us that what we gaze upon can impregnate us with the object, object of our vision, for you can determine what you conceive by what you behold or what you look upon, what you allow in your eye gate. That's your choice. You can determine what you allow in your eye gate, and that's up to you. What you set your gaze upon is what you will give birth to. What you set your gaze upon is what you will give birth to. So I want to ask you and encourage you today to be careful how much of the secular news you watch because you're not certain that any of it is real news or even the truth. In today's world, when I was growing up, the news was just simply the news and it was reported. No opinion. Now there's very little news and a lot of opinion. Be very careful what you listen to. Be very careful what podcasts you listen to. But Be very careful what newscasts you listen to. Be very careful what you look upon. Be very careful what you long for. Be care very careful what you allow yourself. Oh, I wish I had that. What you want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. There's a reason we control our wants because we see it, we want it, and sometimes we don't need it. And we need to be careful and we need to control that. We need to bring it under the subjection of the Holy Ghost. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us, to help us walk in the ways that we were created to walk. Again, please forgive me for coming in so late today, but we were traveling much of the day and then I got to spend some hours with my grandchildren and had the greatest day with them and just came to you because I'm getting ready for Marriage Mondays that will begin in about 30 minutes. So please, 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 I will do my best to come right in at 9 o'clock in the morning, West Coast time. That's uh, noon for the uh, East Coasters, and uh, I will do my best to get right back on schedule for a little bit. Don't forget, Marriage Mondays on our YouTube channel will go live in about 35 minutes. And you are precious to me. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Crystal. All of my East Coast people, Vanessa, Celinda, thank you all for coming up from the West Coast. And uh, I love all of you and I appreciate you so much. 
And I really thank God for you in my life, for all of you who came out to the services when we were in Michigan, from the Gilead Healing Center to the amazing retreat we had in uh, Mackinac Island, and then over the weekend in Grand Blake, Michigan, just south of Flint. What a wonderful time we had. I love you all. Thank you so much for watching. I will upload this to our YouTube channel. Probably won't get it uploaded before we go live, but I'll do my best. And I will see you in the morning with chapter 31. What a great study this has been. Watch what you allow in your eye gate and make sure you watch, listen, comment, and be a part of Marriage Mondays that will begin in 34 minutes. Love you.